Okay, so I'd like to start by explaining some of the points about path components of these spaces uh, that I introduced yesterday. Um, <coughs> and to do that, um, remember I had these statements yesterday that said such and such a map is a homology isomorphism onto those path components that it happens to hit, which is a little unsatisfactory. And one way to characterize them is to say, well, it's those path components which are hit. That, at least I suppose that does tell you what they are. But you, if, if you wanted to, for example, calculate which those are, that's probably a quite difficult problem. So I'd like to give you a slightly different characterization. It's actually not so different, but it seems, it seems like we've done some work. <laughs> um, and to do that, we have to first know what the path components on the right-hand side are, or how to think about them. So firstly, what is pi zero of this loops infinity mt theta. What does that mean? <coughs> well, um, it's the set of path components of an infinite loop space, by definition. <coughs> so that's also the same thing as pi zero of the, of the spectrum mt theta. <coughs> and the spectrum mt theta, if you remember, by definition, uh, maybe I ought to uh, remind you, mt theta is a Tom spectrum. It's the Tom spectrum of uh, the sort of virtual vector bundle minus theta star of gamma uh, mm, 2n over b, where theta was some set vibration. And the homotopy groups of a Tom spectrum always have an interpretation in terms of cobordism classes of manifolds with some structure on them. Okay? At least if it's a Tom spectrum of a vector bundle, which this is. <coughs> and so we just need to, un and that's of course given by the Pontryagin Tom correspondence or whatever you like to call it. So we just have to unravel what the Pontryagin Tom correspondence says for this particular theta. So classical. in Tom correspondence gives pi zero of mt theta is the same as giving, so giving an element in pi zero of mt theta is the same as giving the following sort of data. Firstly, a two-n-dimensional smooth closed manifold. <coughs> Secondly, a map L from M to this B up here. And thirdly, and in a sense this is where the subtlety comes in, thirdly, we now have two vector bundles of dimension 2n on M. We have this tangent bundle, and we have the bundle that you get by pulling back uh, this theta star gamma 2n along L. And the extra piece of data we have is a stable isomorphism between those. Stable. What do I mean by that? I mean there's, a iso there's some k, which you can think of as being very large, and an isomorphism between the tangent bundle of M and the pullback of this. This is for some k that So, <coughs> and now this data has to be taken up to cobordism of things having the same sort of data. So this is modulo uh, cobordism of the same sort of data. <coughs> um, so, so let me describe, if we start with an actual point in m theta w, So if x, Lx, is an element in m theta nw, suppose w is closed now, because then this is exactly where we land, <coughs> then what component does this alpha w theta of x, Lx represent? It's some element in here. More properly, I should put the infinite loop space. 
uh, is what? So I've got to give you three pieces of data, a manifold, an L, and a phi. And it's, in a sense, very degenerate. The manifold is x, which is a manifold of dimension 2n. The map L is the map Lx, which is a map from x to, uh, to b. And the data phi is even more degenerate than it's allowed to be, because it's an unstable isomorphism. Uh, so this phi, maybe I'll decorate it with an x, <coughs> uh, uh, is just the map from it's the isomorphism. Oh, I should have said it's not just a map, it's an isomorphism. <coughs> um, it's the isomorphism that comes from, uh, how do you say it? Uh, theta compose L is tau x. So this, isom this, this equality of maps translates to something when you pull the universal bundle back along it, and it translates to an isomorphism of this form. <coughs> um, so, so that's the component that we get if we start with, uh, if we start with the point x comma lx. Now, we, yep. So, <coughs> um, this alpha theta w was uh, this map that I constructed yesterday. Uh, it was actually some sort of zigzag, but let's pretend it's a map that goes from the moduli space of manifolds of topological type W with a theta structure that is an n-connected map, and it goes to loops infinity of mt theta. <coughs> and it was given by this parameterized Pontryagin tom construction. Really, it's really defined on the fat, the subspace of fat manifolds and so on. And so it's not surprising that because this is given by the parameterized Pontryagin tom construction, if we restrict it to one point, we get exactly what you get by the classical Pontryagin tom construction. <coughs> uh, and indeed, it's true. On here, yeah. yeah, I haven't said that yet, but I, I'll, I'll say that in more detail a bit later. And just yeah, yeah. <coughs> so I, I want to somehow simplify this expression a little bit, because so on, on the right-hand side, in pi zero of this infinite loop space, we, things are given by cobordism classes of such data. So we're allowed to massage it a little bit to put it into a nicer form. Sorry. Uh, coming from, somehow. <coughs> so, oh. Yeah, so if you translate this equation of maps into what happens on their induced bundle maps, it translates to an isomorphism of this form. Um, so I, I want to... Sorry? You said yesterday Yep, yep. Yes, because when you move away from the pi zero level, the coherence questions that you're forced to deal with here become more horrific. Um, but on the pi zero level, this is a perfectly adequate thing to do. So I just want to use the cobordism relation, in fact, in a very trivial way. I'm just simply going to use the fact that if two manifolds are diffeomorphic, then they're cobordant. By a cobordism that doesn't do much, it just reparameterizes the ends. <coughs> By definition, x is in this space, so it is diffeomorphic to w. So I can pick such a diffeomorphism. So choosing a diffeomorphism, or f maybe, uh, from W to uh, which way around should I do it? W to X. Um, this element <laughs> in cobordism is equivalent to the manifold W. Uh, then I have to change this LX by precomposing it with F. And then I have to change the bundle map uh, by precomposing it with the differential of F. OK. 
Okay, so this is just, in a sense, as an abstract manifold, we haven't done anything. We've just reparameterized what the underlying concrete sort of manifold is. I'm thinking of it as being W instead of it being X. Okay, <coughs> and so uh, uh, let me just point out that this LX compose F from W to B is still n connected. So LX was n connected. That's part of what it means to be inside here. And if I compose it with a diffeomorphism, of course, it stays n connected. So <coughs> we can now describe the image of my map alpha in a slightly concrete way. So the image of this alpha w theta is the set of things that arise in this way. And what we've done is we've got rid of this x. So really, it's just the manifold w that we know, because that's the one that we're modeling everything on. <coughs> uh, w, comma, uh, uh, as, as Peter says, I can package this two bits of data into a lift of the Gauss map. I'll go back and forth. It's somehow equivalent. I want to put it in this way. So it's pairs of W comma a lift L uh, such that L is n connected. That's exactly the things that we get as the image of, of this map alpha. <coughs> and so the way to think about that is it's all cobordism classes that are represented by W and some n connected lift of the Gauss map. But any different n connected lifts will, in principle, give you different cobordism classes, even though the underlying manifolds are equal. <coughs> and I'm going to call this square brackets w. This is a subset of pi zero of mt theta. So those are the components which are hit by the map to which the theorem refers. Um, you may think it's a little bit tautological. I suppose it is. <coughs> Question? But well, we're getting there. I know. I know. You're, at least you're keen. <laughs> No, not yet. There will be theme along those lines, but I have to define what the right-hand side will be. Um, I just went, yeah, sorry? Here, here is without boundary. You can make a similar statement. The right-hand side in that case is not pi zero over loop space, it's pi zero over path space. And that also has a cobordism interpretation in terms of manifolds that have some fixed boundary and cobordisms that don't do anything on the boundary. That's a bit more complicated to say. But you can also easily work out an interpretation. <coughs> I just want to point something out. This theorem that I uh, mentioned yesterday that says that the hot, yep. The union over, over what? The union over, over what collection? The union over all those maps over what collection? Over all those alpha Ws of different So I'm, I'm coming to that. Yeah. <coughs> um, so I just want to point out that uh, this, this collection of path components, uh, there's another, maybe you prefer this description. This is the pi zero of h or theta orbit of any w comma l uh. <coughs> that's perhaps a more slightly more conceptual description we pick any n connected theta structure on w and we take the orbit under this change of the, or the sort of automorphisms of theta. Um, this is completely equivalent to that. If you think about the proof of this uh, 
uh, this theorem that I talked about in the exercise session yesterday. <coughs> this is also a quite convenient description. Okay, so now I want to go on to what everybody's been asking questions about, which is what happens as you vary W. So, varying W. <coughs> um, th there's two points of view here. We started with a W, and we produced a theta out of it by making the moore posnikov end stage of the Gauss map of W, and then we stated this thing that I talked about last time. There's a different point of view. You could start with a theta, and you could ask about all the Ws that admit an end connected lift to that theta, i.e. all the Ws for which that theta is a moore posnikov end stage. And if you think about this enough, that's probably the better thing to do. <coughs> so uh, that's what I want to do. Um, <coughs> so I want to let P, it's going to be a 2n minus 1 manifold, inside R infinity. And this is going to be the common boundary of all the manifolds I think about. This is what I'm normally calling partial W, except that there's no fixed W anymore. So I'm going to call it P. So let P be given and LP, P, B, be a lift of the Gauss map of P. <coughs> now I want to define the following, N theta N P, L, P, and this N is conveniently the letter after M, but it also stands for null bordisms. It's the space of all null bordisms of P, i.e. all manifolds whose boundary is uh, let me give you an actual definition. It's a space of pairs of an X inside minus infinity zero cross R infinity, which is going to be a two dimensional manifold, and a map LX from X to B, <coughs> such that, uh, let's see, various things hold. There's some business about a collar, so it contains minus epsilon zero cross P inside it. Uh, X is a smooth manifold of dimension 2n. <coughs> um, LX is a lift of the Gauss map of X. The Gauss map of X makes sense as soon as we know that it is a smooth manifold of the right dimension. Uh, and finally, LX is n-connected. OK? And if you believe that the spaces we've been talking about so far have a topology, then you believe this one does too. And that's the one you should use. <coughs> Let's just think about what this is in terms of spaces that we've talked about. If I have two x's that are not diffeomorphic, then I claim they're not in the same path component. And if you I, mean, I haven't said what a topology is, but I said it's given by small deformations of the manifold, and you don't change diffeomorphisms like by moving the manifold a small amount. So this is just a disjoint union over manifolds W of uh, the spaces that we've been talking about so far, <coughs> where the union is over uh, all diffeomorphism types of uh, two n manifold, two n manifold with boundary P. Okay, so just a way of putting together all of the, it's exactly what you're asking about, way of putting together all of these spaces over all manifolds W that admit an N connected theta structure. And one of the, yep. Oh, yes, yes, I meant to say that. So LX is a, a lift of the Gauss map. Uh, uh, extending LP, yeah. One of the benefits of using this point set description of, uh, of these spaces is that th when I write equality here, that's actually literally true. <coughs> the two sides are literally equal sets. That may or may not amuse you. I find it amusing.
So, so because of this second description, it's just a load of the spaces that we've already been talking about, we can just take the disjoint union of all of these Pontryagin Tom maps that we've been talking about. <coughs> so the union of the alpha theta w's gives a map, uh, I don't know, alpha theta, I suppose, from this space of all nonbordisms of p <coughs> to the usual target. Uh, and now I've definitely got some boundaries. So the usual target is now a path space rather than a loop space. So it's paths from the base point, which goes onto the empty manifold, to p with its uh, given tangential structure uh, of loops infinity minus 1 and t theta. So this is just a disjoint union of all the maps alpha theta w that we talked about before. Um, now I, right, okay. So now I'd like to talk about stabilizing this side by, uh, by con basically by connect sum with Sn cross Sn, i.e. by increasing what I was calling the genus yesterday. Uh, <coughs> and to do that, I'll just say the manifold H, uh, which is the following, it's a cylinder, 0, 1 times p, so just a sort of trivial cobordism from p to p, but then I make it into a non-trivial cobordism by connect summing with Sn cross Sn, somewhere in the middle, somewhere that's not at the ends, obviously, so that it's a manifold still. <coughs> and I can do this and I can do this inside a big Euclidean space, form the connect sum and all the rest of it. So I can suppose this is inside 0, 1 cross R infinity <coughs> uh, is a cobordism from uh, 0 cross p to 1 cross p. Okay? So I do this ambiently, but so that the first part is just embedded as a, as a standard obvious product. <coughs> and now there comes one little thing which I'll, I'll assert. <coughs> so this is a claim. Uh, H admits... a theta structure, uh, so that on the two ends, it's just LP. So it's a, co it's a theta cobordism from LP with its given theta structure to, sorry, with P comma LP to P comma LP. So that it is a cobordism from PLP to itself. Okay? Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it definitely has to. P has to be its boundary. No, it, no, it has to contain this little collar. It has to contain minus epsilon zero cross P. Oh, yeah, P could be empty. Sure, yes, yes. Yes. Yes, it does. It does. Good point. I mean, I said what the union was over, anyway. <coughs> the union is over. Diff is th here it stood for diffeomorphism classes. Sorry, that's a good point. It's it, nothing like the same thing. <coughs> okay, so I, I want to give you one warning about my claim here. Uh one warning about the claim. Um, I've used something about theta here. I've used that theta is n co-connected. If we suppose, so here's a perfectly good tangential structure. Uh, you take EON or EO2N, I suppose, over BO2N. That classifies framing. Okay? And that map is not n co-connected because the fiber is ON or O2N or something. Uh, and it's simply not true that if I give you a framing on P, you can find a framing on this thing that extends the same framing at the two ends. It's not even true if N is 1. In fact, that's the only case I know how to definitely see it's not true. Framings on one manifold are just given by sort of vector field. And the euler poincare theorem says that the difference of the two winding numbers of the framings has to be the Euler characteristic 
of the coborders in between. And because I connect, oh, it has to be the, all, the relative order characteristic, I guess, relative to one end. So on a cylinder, you can definitely do that. But if I connect some with something, you definitely can't. So there's a sort of any framing on a, on a, of a one manifold has a winding number associated to it. And there's a directionality. You can only go from smaller winding number to bigger or maybe backwards. It depends on the convention of what the winding number is. So it's not universally true that for any theta I can do this, but one can do it when theta is n co-connected by obstruction theory, because to build this from that, you only attach n handles and two n handles. If that's a bit much, then just, just believe the claim. <coughs> uh, okay. So, so the point of this is that gluing on H now gives us an automorphism of this space, or an endomorphism, rather, of this space. <coughs> so we then have, uh, I'll sort of write it as if this was composition in the category. <coughs> we then have an uh, endomorphism of this space given by gluing on the cobordism H. So I can be much more concrete about what I mean. I take a submanifold with its tangential structure, and I do the following thing. <coughs> I take the union as sets of x and h. And given that h is between 0 and 1, and x is between minus infinity and 0, they only intersect in p, which luckily they agree at. So this will be a manifold. And I give it the tangential structure that's given by the union of the two maps which because they only intersect a P and they both are lifts that extend LP, the maps glue. <coughs> and finally, this will be a manifold inside minus infinity one rather than minus infinity zero. So I just push it one unit that way. Just translate by one unit in the E1 direction. Okay, this gives me a, a map from this space to itself that increases the genus by one of every, or by at least one of every uh, manifold. It's quite important. Um, it, well, it depends very much what you mean by reasonable. There are certainly, there are certainly bigger things. No, that's no good. That's no good. There are certainly bigger things you can glue on. You can glue on complicated sequences of cobordisms, but they have to contain, every one of them has to contain at least an SN cross SN connection on it. But you need something to have. Yeah, you need to, there's a trick. For, for removing interception problems between middle dimensional submanifolds in a 2n manifold that uses a disjoint copy of SN cos SN. So when you've state, when you, I'm going to do this countably many times in a second. And when you've done that, you have an infinite supply of SN cos SNs, and that lets you solve any sort of interception problem that might arise. That's basically why we use them. Yes, yes, otherwise the connect sum doesn't make sense, yes. <laughs> okay, so as I just mentioned, what I'd like to do now is take a direct limit over countably many applications of this stabilizing map. So I'm going to define <coughs> oh, no, sorry, before that, one more thing. <coughs> so on the, on the other side, on the, on the loop space, or rather part space side, uh, it's not well defined. It, P should better be non-empty so that you can form a connect sum. Yeah, no, SN cos SN has an orientation reversing diffeomorphism, so it doesn't matter. <coughs> P should be non empty, though. <coughs> so on, on the right hand side, on the manifold side, we've got this map that glues on H. You can equally well get an analogous map on the infinite loop space side, 
it corresponds to, if I've got a path from the base point to PLP, the Pontryagin Tom map of H gives a path from P to itself, and you can concatenate with that path. <laughs> so on this side, uh, concatenate uh, the Pontryagin Tom map of H gives a loop based at uh, PLP. And this corresponds to uh, concatenation with this loop. <coughs> uh, so we can now do the following thing. We can take the, the homotopy colimit of my maps alpha theta over iteratedly applying this map H. So I get a new map, which I'll also call alpha theta, that goes from what I'm suggestively going to call the localization of this space at H. And what I actually mean is the homotopy colimit over multiplication by this. <coughs> uh, so I've iterated multiplication by this element. Okay, so that's just a piece of notation I quite like. And so just taking the homotopy codimit of all these maps alpha theta, we get a map to Hokolim over, well, you could sort of say concatenation with alpha theta of H, if you like, this, the, the loop that H corresponds to, of, uh, well, of those spaces up there. Okay, this is somehow the stable version of what I had before, where I was stabilized by H. But now I want, yep. Uh, it's not unique. I did, you have to make a wise choice of one. But there is such a wise choice. Uh, no, you have to make the correct choice. I, I didn't want to do it. You have to make it so that it is theta coordinate to a cylinder. So along the SNs, they have to be, they have to sort of have trivial theta structure. Um, yeah, it's not quite. Yeah, mm, I don't want to get into this. Uh, it's it's theta coordinate for the sort of the. I, this is an answer just for Peter because he knows this language. For the, this is we use something of a bo two n. If you take the such thing of a bo, it should be null in that theory. But it can't be null in BO2N because in BO2N you know the Euler number and it doesn't have to be the Euler number. Sorry. <coughs> um, so, some, okay, something for everyone now. <coughs> um, on this side, what have we got? So, firstly, this is a path space on a loop space. Okay? So, all the path components are homotopy equivalent because it's a loop space. You can just translate back and forth between them. And moreover, concatenating with any loop is a homotopy equivalent. So on this side, we haven't actually done anything. Okay, we've taken a homotopy colimit over a load of maps that are equivalences anyway. Uh, so this is equivalent to, in a non-canonical way, but good enough for what we're doing here. Loops infinity, mt theta. Uh, sorry, to so one copy of this. So, for example, if you want to make it very concrete, the inclusion of the zeroth step in this homotopy codimit is an equivalent. So there's a sort of inclusion like that, and that's an equivalent. Okay. And you see, this is why, because this stabilization on this side doesn't do anything, and on this side, presumably, it does do something, we'll, we'll come to that, you can't possibly hope that before stabilizing, it's an equivalent, right? Because on this side, you're not doing anything. On that side, you're doing something. Yes? Oh, I just mean that it increases this thing I was calling the genus. So the number of SN cross SN sum ends. It, incre it increases that number by at least one in an obvious way. Because in the new bit of the manifold, you've definitely got one more SN cross SN sum end than you had before. It might also increase it more than one, it turns out, but it increases it by at least one. Okay. So, 
So I want to state the theorem now that will only be true once I've done it. Yeah. <coughs> uh, in fact, I can state it immediately. So this is the main theorem. I also had a main theorem yesterday, but this is the stable version of the main theorem. Uh, also due to Song, Galatius, and myself, <coughs> which just says let 2n be at least 4. Then this map, alpha theta, is a homology isomorphism. That's it. So if you remember the main theorem yesterday, it said something was an isomorphism onto the components that it hit, and also in a range of degrees that depends on this genus. But by letting the genus go to infinity, it doesn't, the range of degrees is now infinite, basically. So it's just a homology isomorphism completely. <coughs> uh, for the connoisseurs, this can be upgraded slightly. It's not just a homology isomorphism. It's, in fact, an acyclic map, if you know what that means. It's a little stronger than a homology isomorphism, but weaker than homotopy equivalence. Yep. Yeah. You can include dimension 2 as well. But then it's the theorem that's known. It's called the Mass and Weiss theorem, which I'm going to mention in a second. It's true in dimension 0 as well, <coughs> uh, which I'm going to spend my next talk proving. Uh, right, so the difference is that there are two differences to the unstable version. One is, as pointed out, it works in dimension 4. Another one is, in the unstable version, we needed the manifold to be simply connected. And there's no such hypothesis here. It's the homology isomorphism in all degrees. Yes, that's what I right. That's somehow the advantage that this statement has over the un another advantage that it has over the unstable statement that it makes sense to, so, or rather that it has a consequence on pi zero. <coughs> right. So neither side is postulated now, and so on H zero or equivalently pi zero, this still has content. I'll come to that in a second. Uh, I first just want to point out that so <coughs> uh, to deduce the uh, unsta if this is the stable version, the previous region version is going to be called the unstable version of the main theorem from this. <coughs> uh, you need a result saying that Sort of, if I fix a W now and look at the map just on that, com on that part, <coughs> if you, you know what's happened after you've inverted stabilization by H. So if you know that stabilization by H is also, for example, an isomorphism on certain homology groups, then you get an unstable statement because you're inverting an isomorphism that doesn't do anything. So what you need is a theorem saying that these maps are homology isomorphisms uh, in degrees less than g of w minus 3 over 2, or whatever it was I said the other day, OK? <coughs> uh, under some conditions. And the conditions were that 2n has to be at least 6, and that pi 1 of w has to be 0. And somehow, I, so I'm not going to talk so much about this type of result. This is what's known as a homological stability theorem, for obvious reasons. It says that the homology is stable with respect to this H. <coughs> and the, what's involved in the proof of such a theorem is somewhat orthogonal to what's involved in the proof of the stable statement. OK? Um, <coughs> um, so as I mentioned yesterday, there are many uh, families of what you might call moduli spaces and also families of groups which have this homological stability phenomenon. Uh, in fact, somehow, if you've got a natural family of automorphisms of some mathematical object, it's, it's more usual to have it than to not have it, I would say, in, in the sense that we, you never know how to disprove it. 
<laughs> so we know how to prove this sort of result, and there's very few. We know some places where we can't prove it, but we don't know that it's definitely not true. Uh, so this is one example of that. <coughs> Briefly, let me say one word about what's involved. You need to, suppose you had a map from something into here, and you want to lift it to there. Uh, what's involved in that? Well, you have to take a family of manifolds of the diffeomorphism type of W union H, and you need to somehow produce inside it a trivial family of H's. Right? Because that's what it means to lift it here. You have to find a trivial sub subfamily of H's. And I'm not saying it's a homotopy equivalence. If it were homotopy equivalence in a range of degrees, that would say on small dimensional such families you can do that. That's not that's not true. What is true is that you can somehow you can find a family of a most one of sorry, at least one H. But as you move around in your base, they're allowed to jump. So maybe in this patch I've got this choice of H. And in this patch, I've got a different choice of H. And on the intersection, I've got two choices, and they're disjoint. Um, what you have to, I mean, I'm, I'm claiming you can do this. Um, this is equivalent to saying there's some sort of simplicial complex where the vertices are copies of H and W, and they span a one simplex if they're disjoint, and 10 of them span a nine simplex if they're all mutually disjoint. And what one needs to prove to prove this sort of theorem is that that simplicial complex is highly connected. And, and you can make analogs of that in all of these geometric situations where stability holds. Symmetric groups, general linear groups. In the case of general linear groups, it's quite standard. The complex is what's known as the Bruhat tits building for that group. Here, there's an analog. <coughs> um, but it's a little bit orthogonal to what I want to talk about in these lectures. So I'll just say there is such a theorem, and that's how you deduce the unstable version from the stable version. Um, yeah. Um, uh, some t so the question was, is there some natural operation on the left-hand side that makes this a, a Hox map? Um, not, so, so the left-hand side is not, cannot be an H-space. Uh, but nonetheless, on its homology, sometimes you can still find a Hox algebra structure. For example, in the case where P is one circle, You've got the space of null bordisms of P. If I've got two null bordisms of a circle, I can glue in a pair of pants and get a new null bordism of a circle. So for example, if P has a property that two copies of P is coordinate to one copy of P, then you can try to do such a thing. Um, I don't know if it would make it a Hox map. It does in the case of surfaces, but I don't know in general. Ah, yeah. <laughs> so I want to now... <coughs> um, Absolutely, absolutely. That's the, that's the key homotopy theoretic ingredient, yes. Um, in this generality, it's related to the group completion theorem for categories rather than for monoids, but yes. And in fact, in my next talk, I'm going to use the group completion theorem to prove the, the, this theorem when 2n equals 0. Uh, right, so I wanted to explain uh, uh, one corollary to this, which is what it implies on 0 cohomology, or in other words, on pi 0. Uh, and this corollary... This is what Peter's been asking about all week, <coughs> is, a, is a theorem of Matthias Kreck. But it's, of course, it's very misleading to describe it as a quality of what we do, because almost all of the techniques that we use are used by him as well. And we got a lot of inspiration, actually, from his, from his paper. <coughs> and it says the following thing. If I've got two points, x with its structure and y with its structure, in n theta n plp, uh, are such that um, they give the same cobordism class. So this is in pi zero of this path space, which I'm fed up of writing. All the rest of it. <coughs> so if I've got two manifolds, so two null bordisms of P that happen to be the same in this pi zero of this path space, i.e. they happen, they're coordinate relative p with theta structure and everything. Uh, then, um, then they're diffeomorphic after gluing on some number of copies of H, say K. <coughs> so 
how do we deduce this from the theorem? Well, I've got two points in the left-hand side. Right? I mean, I took them here, but in particular that you can take them in the homotopic codomit as well by the inclusion of the zeroth stage. And I assume they go to the same path component in the right-hand side. That means in the homotopy colimit, they must already be in the same path component. But being in the same path component of that homotopy colimit means after applying enough copies of H, you're in the same path component. So I, I can't estimate what K is here, but there is some K for which this holds. Yeah? Uh, yeah, so actually Kreck's theorem has different Ks on both sides because he uses a slightly different theory over here. It turns out that in this cobordism theory, this empty theta, knows about Euler characteristics. Uh, so you can extract the Euler characteristic from the cobordism class. And hence, that, because you know what H does to Euler characteristic, you can say that they're the same number. Yeah, that's a bit of a trick. And it's somehow not so important for the main conceptual idea. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think this is a rather amazing theorem, really. You don't normally expect that. I mean, produces a diffeomorphism out of cobordism theory, which you can, in principle, in good cases, calculate by characteristic numbers and things like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Right. <coughs> okay. How long do I have? Oh, not very long. Okay. So I wanted to explain how to use this theorem. Oh, no, I do have quite a I said a quarter past. Ah, yeah, yeah. Fine. <coughs> so I'd like to explain how to use uh, the main theorem, I guess, from yesterday, the unstable version. Uh, to solve the problem that I said we were trying to solve, namely, you give me a manifold, and I try to tell you about the homology of its homology spaces, that manifold. Sorry? Moving this and not erasing it? Oh, this is what I just wrote, isn't it? Damn it, sorry. I lost track in my excitement over having 25 minutes left. So if I don't put this addition that was asked about, then you know, if, if you want this conclusion, then there's no given theta structure on x and y. You get to choose a theta structure for which the theorem holds. And the collection of all possible theta structures is one of this ord theta orbits. You just have to know that they're in the same ord theta orbit. I should also say, and this is somewhat related to this homological stability that I won't talk about, if you know something about the fundamental group of X and hence Y, uh, there are a priori estimates for how big K has to be. That's somehow closely related to homological stability. It is homological stability on H0, actually. Um, so for example, if they're simply connected, you need at most one or two, I don't remember. Okay, so. Using the main theorem. <coughs> so I first want to explain a family of manifolds I'm quite fond of, which is the smallest possible collection of manifolds you can take for which the theorem is useful, namely connect sums of SN cross SN. They have definite, by definition, big genus. So I tend to write WG for the connect sum of G copies of SN cos SN. Uh, and I also want to write WG comma 1 for the same thing when I subtract an open ball from it. <coughs> okay, so these are 
just the high dimensional version of the picture that one draws in every talk on low dimensional topology. <coughs> okay, I think of them exactly being the high dimensional analog of a surface of genus G with one boundary. Um, so let's compute what the associated theta structure is for these manifolds. Uh, so what is their theta? <coughs> so we have to make all we know about it is that it fits into a factorization. In fact, yeah, uh, of the Gauss map of this WG. I.e., the first map is n connected, and the second map is n co-connected. Uh, but we know quite a lot about the low-dimensional homotopy of WG, namely, it don't have any. <coughs> so from uh, in fact, it doesn't have, so this is, homo, this is homotopy groups I'm listing down here, and it doesn't have any up to n minus 1, and then in degree n, I guess it has z to the 2g. Okay? <coughs> and this map L is an isomorphism on homotopy groups up to n minus 1, and in degree n, it's the unique thing that factors as Fe mono. Okay? So these are all zero. Uh, over here, in principle, we know up to n, n is well below 2n, so we're well in a stable range, and so we know the homotopy groups here as well by the sort of bot song, uh, but we won't need them for this. <coughs> and uh, then I just want to say, above degree n, uh, this map becomes an isomorphism. Okay? So the only group we don't know is this one in degree n. These ones, in principle, we know, or we know at least relative to knowing the homotopy of BO2n, and the ones below n we know, and in degree n we don't know. Uh, so we want to find out the image <coughs> of the Gauss map on nth homotopy. That's what we want to know. But, of course, the Gauss map classifies the tangent bundle, so in, on nth homotopy, you're just asking, what is the tangent bundle of this manifold restricted to the n skeleton? But the tangent bundle of this manifold to the n skeleton is trivial uh, because, what is it? It's on Sn cos Sn, the tangent bundle is two copies of the tangent bundle of Sn, which is stably trivial. And that's all you need because on a n sphere, you're well within the stable range. So this composition is zero. Uh, and so its image is zero. And so this group is also zero. Okay. <coughs> zero because the tangent bundle, for example, uh, of WG is stably trivial. Okay? <coughs> so what do we have? So B then it has zero homotopy groups up to and including degree n, and above that it has the same homotopy groups as BO to n. Well, that's the definition of the n-connected cover. It's got no homotopy groups down there, and it's got the same homotopy groups above that. So, theta from B to BO to N is the N-connected cover. <coughs> uh, so, I, I prefer a somewhat non-standard definition, uh, d notation for this. And it's non-standard in quite a bad way, because it's the same notation, but it means a different thing. <coughs> so I use pointy brackets n for n connected. Other people use pointy brackets n for n plus 1 connected. I think they're the ones that need to explain what they're doing, rather than me.
And so for small n, we understand what these b's are, or at least we have names for them. So it's theta uh, when n is 1, I suppose. So when n is 1, we're getting bso2 over bo2. Like the one connected cover of BO2 is the universal cover of BO2, and that's the oriented Grossmannian rather than the unoriented Grossmannian. When n is 2, although the theorem doesn't apply, it still has a name. It's B spin 4 over BO4. When n is 3, uh, oh, actually, that theorem does apply. Yeah, yes. <laughs> when n is 3, it does also B spin 6 over BO6, because when you make BO two connected, it for three becomes three connected. Uh, when n is four, it's the thing that people call B string. Eight, I suppose, over BO eight. And then after that, it's just called BO twenty bracket n. <coughs> is there another one? Okay. So, so what I the, the point of giving you this list is that I claim that if you're into this sort of thing, you can compute the cohomology of any of these. I mean, you know the cohomology of that, and then you can use them fiber sequences and all sorts of standard homotopy theory tools to get at that. <coughs> so I want to uh, look at the space of theta n, as I'm calling it, structures on WG1. So space of theta n structures on W, G, 1. And it's important that I'm doing it with the boundary, okay? This was equivalent to, or actually if it was equal to, in the sense I described it the other day, um, the lifts. So I've got the boundary of W, G, 1, which is a 2n minus 1 sphere. I've got the Gauss map of W, G, 1 to B, O, 2n. And then I've got this n-connected cover. And the space of theta structures is the space of lifts, uh, which I again claim that is uh, contractible. <coughs> this is also by obstruction theory. It's because this map is n co-connected. In fact, it's n plus 1 co-connected. And this map is n connected. And if you just think about, for example, how would you use obstruction theory to produce such a map, right? Let me just a little aside on obstruction theory. So obstructions to existence of a dotted map lie in the ith cohomology of W G one relative to its boundary with coefficients in pi i of the fiber. Of theta n. Okay? There should be an i plus 1 somewhere, yeah. No. <coughs> uh, but you see, if i plus 1 is small, then there's no relative cohomology. Because w g1 is built from its boundary by attaching n handles and then a 2n handle. So if i plus 1 is small, there's no cohomology. And if i is big, there's no homotopy. Because the fiber is, because in high degrees, they have the same homotopy. And so they have trivial homotopy in the fiber. And you have to go through the numerology a bit carefully, but those exactly those two intervals overlap. And so they're just the obstruction groups are all zero. And just so that shows the existence of such a dotted map. Uh, and uh, the argument for, for example, uniqueness of such a dotted map up to isotopy is the same, except that maybe there's we go like that. <coughs> and then if I've got two isotopies, the argument to find a path between them is sort of it just goes down. And you see it just gets better than what it, the first case was. The overlap bit it's not like the the overlap get gets bigger rather than smaller. And so you can just, using that, you just prove the homotopy groups of this space are all trivial. <coughs> so we have the following. I've got my undecorated moduli space of manifolds of this type. There's a forgetful map from the decorated version. <coughs> and it's an equivalent, because the space of structures is contractible. And then the main theorem applies to this space here. <coughs> uh, 
that this is a homology isomorphism in degrees less than, well, we can easily compute the genus of this manifold WG because it is a connexome of G copies of SN cross SN. So its genus is G over 2. Okay? So in the end, we get a result about the undecorated, just the plain good old moduli space of manifolds of this type. Uh, but it's nice, it's convenient for the proof to go through these spaces of manifolds with theta structure. Um, Okay, and then I, uh, let me just assert, I mean, if you're into homotopy theory, you can calculate the rational cohomology of the right-hand side in five minutes. It's a polynomial, it's the co rational cohomology of infinite root spaces is always very easy. It's always a polynomial algebra on the spectrum cohomology. And it's a Tom spectrum, so the spectrum cohomology has a Tom isomorphism, so that's basically the cohomology of this connected cover. And taking connected covers in rational cohomology just kills classes. So that's it. You can then just write down a basis for the cohomology. So, I'd like to explain what happens um, if you don't have this boundary. So, we can also ask the question just for WG, but we haven't cut a disk out of it. Ask what we get there. Oh, sorry, before that. So this exact statement, uh, not exact, this statement is also true for 2n equals 2. Uh, and this is, in a sense, the, the motivation for why myself and Songolet started thinking about these high-dimensional manifolds. So this is a combination of the so-called Mass and Weiss theorem <coughs> and the Mass and Weiss theorem corresponds to what I would be calling the stable version of the main theorem. Uh, that's one ingredient and the other ingredient is what's known as Harris stability theorem. which is this homological stability theorem for these manifolds, for, for in this case, surfaces, oriented surfaces of genus G. <coughs> so um, in broad terms, the strategy we use for proving this sort of thing in high dimensions is similar to the strategy used in these two theorems. But these two things are of completely orthogonal directions anyway. So the techniques we use for the stability theorem are very close to what Hera used in a sense, and the techniques we use for the Mass and Weiss theorem are quite close to what they used in a sense as well. <coughs> um, and, right, it's also true when n is zero. There is the barrett pretty quillen theorem, which you may have come across. On the, this side is classifying spaces for symmetric groups, and this side is what people write as QS0 in homotopy theory, so the free, the infinite root space of the sphere spectrum, uh, which is exactly what you come out if you work out what empty theta n should mean when n is zero. You discover it should be the sphere spectrum. So, um, right, I want to talk about the closed manifold WG. So the space of theta structures, or theta n structures, on WG without boundary is not contractible. <coughs> but by the same argument as up here, we didn't really use that this was a sphere. We just used that that map was n connected. So we could have taken that to be one point inside WG. And the same argument would hold, i.e., a theta structure on WG is determined up to homotopy by its restriction to any point. So the space is not contractible, uh, but becomes so when theta, when the structure is fixed at a point. fixed to the point by the same obstruction theory argument. In that case, the space of theta structures 
on WG is just the space of feature structures on one tangent space. So I have to give a lift from BO to N to the N, to cover BO to N of the map from a point into it, i.e. I have to give an element in the fiber of theta N. Uh, so the space of theta structures on WG is equivalent to the homotopy fiber of theta N, which is sort of the space of theta N structures on a point. So if, you've, if we choose it on a point, then there's no homotopy theoretic obstruction to extending it to the rest of WG, but there is some choice about what to do on a point. <coughs> um, so we need to know what the homotopy fiber of theta N is. But that's, again, easy, because it's just an N-connected cover. So the fiber is just the loop space of a truncation of the base. So this is, uh, let me get this right. I always get the indices off. We take the group O2N, and we truncate its homotopy so that it only lies between 0 and n minus 1, i.e. we kill pi n and higher by attaching cells. So it has the same homotopy groups as O to n in degrees up to and including n minus 1, and has trivial homotopy in degrees of up to n. <coughs> um, so that's O as in orthogonal group. <coughs> um, so let me just say, uh, you can consider BO2N N BO2N theta N uh, as a principal bundle for this group. Now, of course, you have to be a little poetic in what you allow yourself to call a group. <coughs> um, but you can make a truncation functor which is nice and functorial, for example. And it will send things that are grouped to things that are at least sort of A infinity spaces or something nice like that. <coughs> so you can make sense of principal bundles for this truncated Lie group. <coughs> so in particular, uh, if you have a principal bundle, then the group itself acts as automorphisms of that bundle. Okay, here's how I'd like to actually do it. So, because we're only, I mean, it's not literally a group, that's part of what I'm saying, not literally a group, but it's a A infinity space or something like that. Because BO and BO2N have the same homotopy up to about dimension 2N, uh, we can obtain this truncation by pulling back the truncation of BO. And this, uh, you can realize, is an infinite loop map. And so the fiber is an infinite loop space. And so it's hence at least in the infinity space or something like that. Another way to say it more concretely is you can, you can express it as a principal bundle by taking the truncation of BO. Uh, now you have to, there's a shift of one. I can just truncate BO by killing the homotopy groups above N. And then the fiber will be the connective cover. And by construction, it's a principal thing because it's pulled back from something else. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> uh, and in particular, if I have a principal bundle, a G principal bundle, then G acts on the bundle by bundle automorphisms. So I get a map. From this group to H or theta. In particular, the group itself acts on the principal bundle. <coughs> and again, I only have one trick, which is obstruction theory. So by obstruction theory, you can prove that this is an equivalence. In fact, this is, in a sense, the most unsatisfying part of the theory. It's very difficult if I give you a random theta to work out what is homotopy automorphisms. That's the most difficult part. The only technique I have is to guess and then check by obstruction theory that you were right. There must be a better way. <coughs> uh, so let me just say, in this case, so, so the corollary to the main theorem gives uh, a 
homotopy theoretic calculation of the homology of MWG. In this case, the approximation was you take loops infinity MT theta N, um, and then you take the Boyle construction with respect to this group of automorphisms, i.e. this thing here. <coughs> so this is homology isomorphism in degrees less than g minus 3 over 2, okay? And what you discover is that WG and WG1 definitely have different homology because they differ by taking a quotient by this group. And if you think about varying n, this group is never trivial. So it's never true that WG and WG1 have the same homology. Uh, if I have one more minute, if people know about the madsen weiss theorem, you might think that's surprising because it is true that the homology of the mapping class group of surfaces with no boundaries and with one boundaries have the same homology. And the difference is that here I'm talking about all diffeomorphisms of WG, not just the orientation preserving ones. <coughs> um, but there is a, a version of the main theorem, or more precisely of this corollary, for orientation preserving diffeomorphisms, if that's what you want. And in fact, it's more general than that. I think this is quite a nice idea, so I'd like to explain it before we finish. <coughs> so if, if we have a factorization of theta, Um, then what did we do? We used this homotopy automorphisms of theta to go between manifolds with theta structure to manifolds with no structure. But there's a sort of Galois theory. You can go to any intermediate structure as well by not using all the automorphisms of theta, only using some of them. <coughs> so in this situation, it's probably safe as if we go ahead and make everything a vibration so I don't say anything stupid. <coughs> uh, you get M theta N W Borel construction homotopy automorphisms of theta bar, and that computes m theta prime w. So, so this is, I think of this exactly like a sort of Galois theory. There are intermediate theta structures, and you take subgroups of the homotopy automorphisms. Of course, everything has to be in a homotopical sense. <coughs> and you can get, uh, yeah. And there should be some there's some sort of components I should fix here that I can't quite remember the formula for, but it's not all, it doesn't hit all components, it only hits those that can be further lifted to a theta structure. <coughs> uh, but then using that, then there's a better version of what I was calling the corollary. So this is the co sort of uh, corollary to main theorem improved version. says that if you want this theta structures on W, you can compute that by not taking the full quotient by ORP theta, but only taking a partial one. <coughs> uh, this is homology this is isomorphism, uh, modulo being careful with the path components. And now we need to be careful on both sides. Here we need to be careful, and here we need to be careful because we have to make sure we're doing the ones that do lift to. So you can only use theta prime structures that do lift to a theta structure, which may not be all of them. <coughs> so there's a somehow intermediate version of between the main theorem and the main corollary that allows for any intermediate theta. So for example, all of these manifolds WG are orientable because they're all simply connected. <coughs> so we can take this BO... 2n n connected, and it lifts to bo bso sorry bso 2n, which goes to bo 2n. So this is theta prime. This is what I'm calling theta bar, and the whole thing is what I've been calling theta n. 
And using this, you can get at the orientation preserving diffeomorphisms of W. So you get what I might call M plus of WG. So this is pairs of an X and uh, orientation of X such that X is diffeomorphic to WG. And that gets computed by loops infinity MT theta N to well construction homotopy automorphisms of this thing here. <coughs> uh, and I'll just do the calculation for you. Here, the homotopy automorphisms with the, the truncation of O to N. And here, of course, you get SO to N, as you would expect if you're doing orientation preserving things. <coughs> and now you see there's one funny strange thing, is that this is some w one time this is contractible. When n is 1, the zero truncation of SO to n is contractible. And in only that case, the oriented mapping class group of a surface with one boundary and the oriented mapping class group of a closed surface have the same homology, because the difference is a contractible group. But that's just a massive accident. <coughs> and actually, it was a very misleading accident, because the way we were thinking about this higher dimensional thing is we should generalize what's true for surfaces. And that's just not true in higher dimensions. <coughs> so. They're not really that specific. I mean, it sees the n type of a 2n manifold, but by this trick that I explained in the exercise session yesterday, you can make a pretty random n dimensional complex look like the n skeleton of a manifold. So it's actually not, the fact that it comes from a manifold is not so special. It's n, it's, it, it, it is n co connected, and that makes it quite special. One property that has is that because, the, because theta is n co connected, the group H or theta is always n co-connected, as we saw here. That's a general phenomenon. And so it only has, if you're interested in computing its homotopy groups, you know how, what you're in for. There's only a range in which you have to do something. Uh, rationally, you can get at the higher homotopy groups of it. The difficulty is computing pi zero of H or, the, of H or theta. And no amount of rational homotopy, or, that's an actual, even if you're only interested in rational calculations of this, you have to understand pi zero of that integrally and pi zero of that integrally. And that's somehow, the, I think that's the main difficulty with actually applying it. In nice cases, you can do that. Uh, apart from that, everything else can be done rationally in a pretty formal way. Uh, this one up here, for example. So I just mean, <coughs> so, so for any space x, you can make a, a map to a new space called x0n. The, the property is that this map is an isomorphism on homotopy groups up to and including n. And it, this space has zero homotopy groups above that. And you just build it by attaching cells to kill all those homotopy groups that you don't want. So it's more or less sort of unique and so on. Yeah, it's the Posnikov, it's, it's the more Posnikov factorization of the map from X to a point. That's another way to say it. Sorry, say again. So, no, it's not. It's not, yeah, it was what's the relationship between what I was calling here an accident and uh, what I said is a homological stability phenomenon for mapping class groups of surfaces only. Namely, the going from uh, W, let me get it right. So one consequence of this, in that case, where the group you're dividing out is trivial, is that M of WG1 mapping to M plus of WG is a homology isomorphism in a range of degrees. 
where this is just a map that takes a diffeomorphism of WG1 and extends it to a diffeomorphism of WG by gluing in a disk. Or alternatively, if you think about this as being subset manifolds inside R infinity, it glues on a null bordism of the sphere to the, to the Y. <coughs> um, the theorem shows that they're both now calculated by the same thing. Because, it, so they're always calculated, this is always calculated by that, and this is always calculated by that. Well, uh, so, so you can't phrase homology stability on this side because there's nowhere to glue anything. The only sort of map you can study for homology stability is this one. There's no map going out. And it's well known, so in the case of surfaces, Pera proved that this map is an isomorphism on homology. Um, but that somehow should not generally be true. Uh, in fact, is, not, is, is never true apart from for surfaces. <coughs> it's not stability in the sense of increasing the genus. You can't increase the genus if you've got a closed manifold. It's just, yeah, this map. You can take the view that homology stability isn't just about gluing on SN cross SN, it's about gluing on anything. In which case, this is an example of that, it's gluing on a disk. Uh, yeah, so I, for surfaces or for these sort of manifolds? For the WGs, um, I did briefly, and then it, it got quite difficult. So the theta will be the same. The difficulty, I haven't quite told you what you have to put here. I, I did a tr I, I pulled a trick on you, you see. When I did the case of manifolds with boundary, where is it? Oh, I've erased it. When I did the case of manifolds with boundary, what I just did, I manually showed that the space of theta structures was contractible. And so M of WG1 was the same as M theta of WG1. And then I use the main theorem, which doesn't involve this or theta. I did that to avoid telling you what I should use for this group when the thing has boundary. But there is something you can use for the group when the thing has boundary. What you have to do is you have to take automorphisms of B over BO2N and under the boundary of W. And you have to be a bit careful to make that a co-fibration and a fibration before you do so. So there is still a thing, and so, but the effect of that is that as the, if the boundary becomes complicated, that group becomes more complicated. You know? With ordinary groups, of course, if you take groups that fix a thing, it becomes a smaller group, but homotopically that's not true. It can just become a bigger group. <coughs> and so if you take many, compa yeah, I'm sure you could work it out, but it's, it's quite bad. If I remember correctly, it's something like if you take, if you cut out P disks, Maybe you get P copies of this truncation, one for each disk, or something like that. <laughs> 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 